Hi guys, Olive here, here today to talk about The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I had never read this book before. I was not required to read it in school, though I know a lot of people were. And over the years, I have heard so many people hate on this book. They hated reading it in school. They've hated it ever since. So that chorus of hatred, plus the fact that this is a book about Puritans, it's about morality in a Puritan town, it didn't exactly sound like something I would be interested in reading. So imagine my surprise when I pick it up this month and I ended up really enjoying it. In case you didn't already know this about The Scarlet Letter, it's a story that takes place in the aftermath of an act of adultery. We find out that there's a woman named Hester Prynne. She's a married woman sent to live in New England, sent ahead to move to New England ahead of her husband with the understanding that he'll be following her at some point. Well, he gets held up for a variety of reasons, but no one in the town knows that he's been held up. No one knows if he's alive or dead. And Hester's just living there alone. And while Hester is living in Boston without her husband, she becomes pregnant. She hasn't seen her husband in a while, so obviously that cannot be his child. So it's abundantly clear that she's been unfaithful to her husband. She has committed the act of adultery. And the first scene of the main story is probably the most famous one, with Hester standing up on the scaffold in front of the entire town, wearing the letter A on her chest for adulterer while holding her her baby, two badges of what she's done. What she doesn't know in that moment is that her husband is in the crowd and he's watching her hold this child who cannot possibly be his. He goes to visit her when she's in jail. And just like she wouldn't when she's in front of the entire town, she won't reveal the name of the man who got her pregnant. But her husband vows to find out. He swears her to secrecy about his identity since no one in the town knows him. And he takes up a new identity as he tries to hunt down the man responsible. I have a very strong suspicion that a big part of why people hate this book so much is because it was forced upon them when they were in school. Because I think required reading in general is a really quick way to get people to hate not just what they're reading, but reading in general. But that's a different conversation for another day. As I was reading this book, I felt very conflicted because on one hand, I think it makes a lot of sense that if we're going to have required reading, that this would be chosen as a piece of required reading. But then on the other hand, I don't think it made any sense at all to require students to read this. The main reason why I think it makes sense that this book is chosen as required reading is the fact that this book is filled like, to the brim with very powerful symbols. I mean, the whole book is named for one, the scarlet letter that Hester Prynne wears on her clothing. And that's just the main symbol when I think nearly everything in this book is a symbol when you really get down to the nitty gritty details. And there are also a lot of outer manifestations of things going on internally within these characters, meaning that characters' physical appearances say something about who they are as people which as an adult, I don't love because number one, that's lazy writing. And number two, I think it sends the wrong message to impressionable young people, if this is being assigned to them at a fairly young age. You can't tell who someone is by looking at their physical appearance. I really hate that message. This is why we have a million true crime documentaries where someone inevitably says, well, he looked like a nice guy. Of course he looked like a nice guy. Did you expect him to have serial killer stamped on his forehead? But I digress. So Hester's daughter Pearl is named that because she's a beautiful gift, but she's one that her mother paid the ultimate price for. And then Pearl's father, I won't say his name here because that's technically a spoiler, he holds his hand over his heart. And that's supposedly because he's suffering from some sort of unnamed ailment. But we know the real reason he does it. It's because that's where he's carrying his shame. Hester wears hers in the form of a letter A that she wears outwardly. He wears his just on the inside. Hester's husband's appearance turns sinister as he grows more and more desperate to find and punish the man who slept with his wife, I hate to use the word obvious when it comes to the imagery and symbolism in this book, because I do think it was very effective, but it is kind of 
clear kind of in your face. And I think the hope is to start students with books like this and like The Great Gatsby, which I think is a brilliant book, but is also pretty heavy handed with the symbolism. I think the hope is to start students with very clear and straightforward examples of symbolism and imagery. And then later on, they'll be able to pick up on more nuanced examples. But the thing that doesn't make sense to me about why this would be chosen as a piece of required reading is the language. The language definitely stood out to me as I was reading this book. I thought it was really beautiful. I really enjoyed it. But you can't deny that it's very upright, very starched. And I can't imagine a modern teenager feeling comfortable reading this. The thing you have to understand when you're getting ready to read the classics is that the main hurdle is going to be getting used to the language. It's not the way we speak now. It's not what you're used to hearing, what you're used to reading. So it takes some practice. I think that's completely normal. I was not an English major in college. I didn't even take any English classes. So when I graduated, I definitely was feeling a lack of education in that area. So I kind of took it upon myself to fill in holes. I've been reading a lot of classics over the past six or seven years, and I've gotten used to that language, language that I wouldn't have had a chance of understanding at age 16 or 17. So I would have been one of those people who would have hated this book in high school. So while I do see and understand why this was chosen as a piece of required reading, however long ago, and then kept around as a piece of required reading ever since, sense. I don't think this is the best book for high schoolers. I think there have got to be better choices out there. I'm glad I was never forced to read this in high school because I read it as an adult who's comfortable with classics and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the things it made me think about when it comes to morality. The story of The Scarlet Letter is really a showcase of moral failings within society, layers of moral failure within society. So at the top level, you have the most obvious one, Hester Prynne cheating on her husband and having a child with someone else. Although it could definitely be argued that her mistake is not as massive as everyone makes it out to be, she's alone in Boston without her husband. She has no idea if he's alive or not. But out of all the characters in this book, she is the only one to really accept and come to terms with her mistake. She wears the scarlet letter. She doesn't move out of town. She doesn't shy away from acknowledging her own mistake. She even makes the A that she wears everywhere more ornate. Then there's the father of Hester's child. Again, I won't say his name in case you haven't read the book, but he refuses to publicly take responsibility for what he's done and the child he helped to create. And then there's Hester's husband, who is so obsessed with getting revenge he is fixated on finding this man and making him pay. And he allows those feelings to warp him internally. And then at the deepest level, there is society saturated in their hypocrisy. They accept a woman who publicly acknowledges that she practices witchcraft. And each of them individually, they have their own flaws. They make their own mistakes, but they are more than happy to shun Hester and her child. Basically, no one is clean in this book, with the exception of Pearl, who is repeatedly referred to as otherworldly, which I'm sure is a symbol of the fact that she grew up outside of the society and thus was not corrupted by it. It. But this book never felt like a condemnation of any one character. Instead, it felt like a condemnation of society as a whole, at least to this society. Because give a group of people enough power to render a verdict on someone and their mistakes, and that group of people will most likely abuse it. I came away from this book with a very modern lesson, and that's the fact that we're all human. We're going to make our own mistakes. We're going to be wronged by others. Both of those things are to be expected. But what matters in both of those cases is our response. And I think the character most worthy of emulation is Hester Prynne. She shows so much grace in this book. She doesn't shy away from the fact that she's made a mistake. She owns that mistake. She wears the scarlet letter. She doesn't move away from the town. She loves her child. She doesn't allow this mistake in society's treatment of her to corrupt her feelings 
about her child. She does right by the man who got her pregnant. She refuses to reveal his name, even as he's wronging her by not making it public, not taking responsibility for what he's done, as the entire town punishes her alone for the mistake that they made together. And who are the people of this town to condemn her forever when not one among them is free of sin? They can chastise her for sure if she's made a mistake in the eyes of society anyway, but to never allow space for forgiveness? That's a moral failing on society's part. And the same thing goes for Hester's husband. He was wronged in this situation. I think we can all acknowledge that. His wife was unfaithful and she had a baby with somebody else. He kind of has a right to be angry, but did it do him any good seeking revenge? And the same thing for the father of Hester's child. What good did staying silent do? Like I said before, even though this is a book about a puritanical society, I saw a lot of modern, a lot of enduring messages in this book. A lot of things about the inherently flawed nature of people and what happens when we live in denial of that fact. And because of those messages, this book really got my wheels turning. And most frequently when that happens in a book, I go on to really like it. And I really liked this book. But I want to hear from you. Have you read this book? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Are you somewhere in the middle? I would love to discuss this book with you down in the comments. So leave me your thoughts down there. But if you'd like to keep up with what I'm reading and writing about right now, you can find me on social media and some other places around the internet. The links to everywhere you can find me will be in the description box below as well. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video. Bye.